All right, so um, now we're gonna start digging into like antidotes. Okay, so I think we've set the scene. I think that we're pretty clear <laughs> on the trouble. Um, but if you're not feeling totally clear about what's the troublemaker and what's the helper or what's the beneficial and what's the negative, if they still feel tangled to you and you wanna flush it out, um, please do ask some, some follow-up stuff. So experientially, when you look at those two sides, is it easy enough to find yourself in those two descriptions or do you find it difficult to see yourself in those two sides? Yeah, you, can you see yourself when you've connected with love as opposed to when you've connected with attachment and there being a clear distinction Sometimes you can frame it as rational or irrational <laughs> as easily as loving and attached, um, but it can be hard. You know, that's my colloquial framing of information that you can find in the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa, as well as a number of other sutras. There was, in a lot of your questions last session, I could feel that there was kind of a maybe a need or a connection to the topic of minds and mental factors. So I would really recommend you connect with classes on minds and mental factors, ask for your teachers to teach on that because there is, there's a difference between main mind primary consciousnesses and states of mind mental factors. They're different, you know, they engage in the same objects at the same time with the same aspect, but there's kind of the moving pieces and then there's the spacious clarity, you know, there's the clouds in the sky. And sometimes we uh, associate things that are mind with things that are actually mind mental factors and vice versa. And of course it's all consciousness, it's all under the big heading, but um, it's easy to get confused about what is it exactly that you're able to manipulate or navigate or train within your mind. And Anyway, so minds and mental factors, maybe just kind of make a mental note. That's an excellent topic to study to understand better what things you do have control over within your own mental experience. Um, okay, so experientially clear enough. Um, and you, you're clear enough about also that the way your attachment manifests is not necessarily the same as the way other people's attachment manifests. Could you feel that distinction? Like for some people, an attached mind is very busy. For other people, an attached mind is very blank. You know, it's not the details. We're talking about kind of the essence of the mistake and then how it applies to you. So when you're, I guess some people feel very anxious when they're attached. Some people feel very needy when they're attached. Some people feel kind of happy and excited with an edge of anxiousness. Um, some people just get kind of hungry and spacey and, you know, everywhere scattered, but it's important to know your style. It's important to know what happens in your body as well. Can you feel that there's kind of a difference in your physical experience when attachment's the driver? Is, is there a difference? Um, yeah, it's exactly what I was thinking before the, the previous uh, session, how it feels different in the body when I in love state of mind or attachment state of mind. And actually I'm kind of investigating it lately. Mm. And it's really true. I mean, it's different because when there is love, something is open and there is like space, you know, in the heart area. And when there is attachment, something is more, I don't know, stressed and closed and it, uh, yeah. Oops. Yeah, yeah, it definitely that. And what's difficult is sometimes attachment can have sort of like flickers of a pleasurable something together with kind of attention. You know, there's kind of a a, a wanting or a grasping or something together with something kind of pleasurable, but it, it's, it's all kind of weird, you know, and sometimes your body um, under the influence of attachment 
you can kind of stiffen up or you can kind of um, blob out. It depends on the person. You know, some people get very floppy and squishy and sort of, you know, and some people get really, you know, and um, yeah, and there was this question in the chat about um, infidelity and attachment, which is a fantastic segue into our antidotes, because <laughs> it's a thing, right? Um, we, we remember that in Buddhism, uh, sexual misconduct, you know, is this big category and some of the things in the category are historically relevant points about, you know, hygiene and community harmony and things that are sort of, some of them are out of date and some of them are still applicable, but the essence is using sexual energy in a way that is harmful is sexual misconduct. And strangely, the worst form is adultery. They don't say the worst form of sexual misconduct is rape or child abuse. They say adultery, which is so weird. And I had huge arguments with my teacher when this first was um, being discussed in depth at the nunnery where I did my training. I was like, how could you possibly say that it's worse? That's, that's crazy. And he was saying, of course, the harm to the individual isn't worse. The harm to the individual in the case of rape and sexual assault and you know child abuse is way worse of course it is it's the harm to the community that is worse with adultery yeah because there's a ripple effect around adultery that um you know really can tear families apart fundamentally and i yeah and i'm you know i see some heads shaking and i'm not totally on board with that presentation either um i think that another reason why they say adultery is the worst form is that sexual misconduct is talking about sexual behaviors that a normal consenting adults might get into. And things of the kind of rape and child abuse category are so terrible that they're kind of not even in sexual misconduct. They're just so awful. Sexual misconduct is talking about what regular afflicted people might get up to. So there's some different discussions around why that framing is the way it's framed. Um, but infidelity or adultery is seen as very, very negative because of the impact on families. So if everybody's on board, if everyone's in agreement, if there's some sort of polyamorous thruple situation happening and everybody's all very transparent and consenting adults and all of that, it's kind of like, oh, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is betrayal. Do you know what I mean? So why would you do something that's betrayal? Out of attachment, right? Yeah, no, go ahead. It's a, it's a little bit of a volatile subject, but. I, I, it makes me, when you describe that, it, it, where that lands with me is um, that maybe because it's more covert and implicit that it can um, permeate our minds in deeper levels and so deceptive and manipulative um, that it can be, uh, it, it, it might be, you know, sort of harder to detect because it masquerades in, in, in so much deception. Um, but that's good food for thought because I would have thought the opposite because of yeah. that anger. There's a specific target, you know, for that that gets projected and certainly. Yeah, and I think if we're rating what is the most harmful thing to the person you do it towards, of course, things of the you know assault category are far above and beyond traumatic and horrible to the individual. But a lot of these things are talking in terms of community harmony and um, the impact on families. And of course, there's, very valid arguments that one person who's sexual assaulted and then the assault or has a huge ripple effect on a family worse so than adultery of course there's an argument for that and i would be one of the ones making that argument <laughs> um, but when you're hearing tibetan geshis frame it this way or you're looking at traditional presentations try and hear it from that's the perspective they're coming from they're not saying that these other behaviors are at all acceptable or okay. They're much more talking about you lot in front of me who are generally ethical, generally kind people. Yeah. What are the naughty things you might get up to and what's the worst of that? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Deception that it looks ethical, but it's not. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's really destructive. I, I do have a question 
is it's going to take us in a different direction. Is it okay if I ask that or? Yeah, you... sure. And if it's not the right time, we'll do it later, but yeah, pop it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was curious about um, when we talked about detachment uh, and we talk about love when and, and what is and what isn't and can I feel the difference? Um, I guess where maybe I could use some clarification is in that place of detachment, it can feel to me like a neutrality. Mm -hmm. um, and so almost sort of almost like being in observation mode. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, where, where the love part comes in. Um, it can, it can be sort of layered with that energy, although it can also be layered not with that energy. So that, yeah. that led me to, the, to ask the question, wow, so what's the relationship between that neutrality and detachment and detachment woven with the, the threads of love? Yeah, no, when you're talking about kind of the categorization of mental experiences, non-attachment is a virtuous mental factor, but non-attachment does not equate to love. You can have non-attachment plus patience yeah. or non-attachment plus love or non-attachment plus this and this and this and things that are of a similar type can all go together. You know, the fundamental premise is that discordant states of mind cannot exist simultaneously. So you can't have love and attachment in exactly the same moment. They can go back and forth very, very quickly, like in the case of an argument with someone that you quote love, but really you're, you love them, then you're attached to them, then you're angry at them, then you love them, then you're attached to them, then you're angry at them, and they flicker you know, very quickly. Um, so there's non-attachment. And then love is actually in the category of generosity of all things. Yeah, it's like where if you're looking through the Buddhist dictionary and categorization, where is love? Where is love? And yeah. love is described not in the 11 virtuous mental factors, but it's described in the category of the six perfections under generosity. One of the forms of generosity is loving kindness. So remembering that generosity is the intention to give. Yeah, that's the definition in Buddhism, the intention to give. And you can be giving dharma, you could be giving freedom from fear, you could be giving loving kindness, or you could be giving material aid, which is what we normally would consider generosity. But actually the three more uh, mental and experiential and, you know, kind of less tangible versions of generosity are considered higher. So it's interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. That's so helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else before we go into um, antidotes? You feeling pretty tidy about the nature of attachment? Um, I have sort of an observation and, and about something that's frustrating. I noticed that whenever I put something out in the world, um, nowadays, of course, I'm mostly sitting at home communicating remotely with people. So I put something out there. Uh, in the spirit of just this open wanting to share. And then I catch myself going back to Facebook or whatever it is and seeing, you know, did they like it? And I know Facebook is designed to, to, to poke that, but it, it's kind of frustrating how consistent that is that I, I feel like, like my ego, if you want to use that term, my egoic mind, it, it's always, always trying to sabotage things that I did with kind of an open spirit. And uh, it's, it's frustrating. It's where I'm at these days is that I, I, would, I would like to be able to enjoy the, the, the happiness of just giving freely without, you know, that, that uh, my ego kicking up afterwards. Same, yeah, same, <laughs> same. <laughs> and, um, so you haven't figured out the answer yet, huh? <laughs> well, I, uh, the, the answer that I have for myself is a sense of humor. 
like like for example you know you guys know I have a YouTube channel and I have whatever however many subscribers and then I could there could be like a random cat in Norway that has like three times as many subscribers just like videos of the cat chasing something way more people interested in that than Dharma you know or Dharma from me <laughs> right and you know and that and it cracks me up you know because it's like it's out there for whoever has a karmic connection with Buddhism and with an American style of, of, you know, a millennial female style, like, you know, there's something out there for everyone and everyone is motivated by attachment most of the time. So even if they like Buddhism and they're, you know, in their YouTube vortex, they're going to be like, Ooh, Buddhism cat video. <laughs> you know, there's going to be like the urge to do the virtuous productive thing that they love but then the intimidation of all of the things it will ask of them. And so a uh, cat video, you know, and, and so that kind of can help loosen up the, the tension in my body that says, was that useful? Did anyone think that was useful? I don't know. Was that useful? Should I do that? I don't know. This cat is, you know, thousands of views. I have five, you know, but then I think, well, those were five people that actively, were, you know, using a conversation I had at one point to look deeply into themselves. And that feels like a good day's work. So, <laughs> you know, somehow context and perspective and humor. And, Thank you. and I, Thank you know, you. that's helpful. Thanks. And I, and I find that like, the more self-awareness I have about the mistakes in my motivation, the less they come in. Whereas when I'm pretending I don't have the mistakes in my motivation, that it's much more easy for the good thing to be co-opted, you know? So if I go in thinking I'm doing this offering because I really want to be of benefit to sentient beings and part of me is bored and wants human connection, <laughs> you know, if I know that going in, then I'm less likely to be driven by being bored and wanting human connection. But if I pretend that's not what I want also, then it sneaks in, it's insidious. You know, it's like attachment, such a liar. It's such a liar. And, you know, so if you can catch the lies you tell yourself then just not, nah. <laughs> you know, and it really does make you laugh at yourself. And then, you know, I don't know, shake it off. But you're not alone, <laughs> you're not alone. Um, yeah, okay, so now we're gonna talk about if attachment's the troublemaker, love is our friend, how do we cultivate love much more deeply and proactively in a way that sticks? And how do we get rid of attachment when it's either when it's manifest or preventing it from arise? So of course the disclaimer is if we were to realize emptiness directly, a lot of this would be solved. And at the same time, realizing emptiness directly is a very long-term project. So we work on it when we can, but in the meantime, if we can make sure negative states of mind are less likely to become manifest and we really retrain our mind in new habits, then our quality of life lifts right away and our benefit to others lifts right away. So we'll just start kind of unpacking that and then we'll do another meditation. First, using analysis, okay? So we can also use mindfulness meditation, but using analysis, here's kind of what you'd get up to if you wanted to cultivate more love or deepen the love that you already have. So, you know, the first thing is we need equanimity and that's the foundation of pretty much all of our positive qualities is we need to really deeply connect with equanimity. And then from that basis, we can use the beginning of the sevenfold cause and effect instruction for bodhicitta. So steps one through three are for developing love. And then another one is seeing their or other people's suffering and their potential for enlightenment. And another one is looking at interdependence. So these are all separate skills. And of course they reinforce each other and they all work together, but one of them or another of them might strike you better some days than others, or you might have more familiarity and kind of a liking for one more than others. So these are logical ways into love. Um, and logical ways into love turn into experiential experiences of love. Um, but you need a little bit of conception to touch what we're getting to. So we'll start with equanimity. When people say develop equanimity, 
what do you hear? Do you, yeah, what do you hear? Do you hear neutral or do you hear something more than neutral? Do you hear balance? Yeah. Yeah, say again. Emotionally stable. Emotionally stable, yeah. Yeah, like no matter what happens, you're not jumping up and down like want to kill yourself or just so happy that everything great and perfect all of a sudden it's just an evenness i think more anything yeah yeah like a, a like emotional independence stable yeah for sure for sure that connotations there yeah but yeah what else do you hear when you hear equanimity uh i hear calm and accepting yep yeah yeah equanimous calm and right. accepting yeah yeah, yeah. and think, then yeah go um, ahead i think like initially when people hear that they tend to think that they need to love everyone equally um and you know not see their parents you know <laughs> and not see this, their parents like higher than strangers and i don't think that's that's you know that's very scary and unnatural so um, I heard once an explanation that relaxes the, that, that concern, but I forgot it ever since. <laughs> Who gave it to you? Yeah. We shall interview them. <laughs> I'm staying here with my initial sense of being scared a little bit of like giving hugs to strangers in the street. <laughs> well, and this is, I'm really glad that you brought that up because this is kind of the, the essence of what I want to talk about with equanimity, that having unbiased goodwill and impartial love is not the same thing as having identical rapport. Having the degree of rapport that you have with people is going to vary person to person, day to day. You know, some people you'll just naturally have a great conversation. Some people you just will not get each other. Sure, you know, some people you have very little in common and the potential for annoyance is high. Sure. All of that can be true and you can still have equanimous goodwill, equanimous loving kindness and compassion, which is like equal love and compassion for all. Well, the behavior is a rational kind of adjusting to the relationship. You know, so for a stranger, my love looks completely different than to a close friend or my family member, but I'm trying to have the heart open the same amount. But it's different words, it's different conversation topics, it's different physical behaviors, and that doesn't negate equanimity. So sometimes the conversation about equanimity makes it sound like you're supposed to the same amount of rapport with everyone, like you're supposed to like, like all sentient beings the same, you know, and your surface kind of like, that can be totally variable while the depths is equanimous love, may you all be happy. Yeah, may you all have happiness. May I facilitate that happiness in whatever way I can. May I be a strong condition for your happiness however I can. But the problem with misunderstandings of equanimity is you can start to feel like you're being disloyal to your more, quote, significant relationships if you have the same amount of love for everyone as you do to your partner or your closest friend. It feels disloyal, you know, or it feels like you're making it not special. You know, and then you feel kind of like cringy and weird. And what you want to do is to think of that person that you love the most in this world, that you have the most genuine, unconditional love for. Think of them and then think how wonderful it would be to feel that way about everyone. That you could expand the heart to be like that towards everyone and even elevate that level as well. You know, if you can be kind of objective and think of it more like a skill, you know, like say you're learning the skill of learning how to ski. I don't know, I'm in Montana now, so I'm thinking about skiing. Um, if you learn very well how to use the muscles involved with skiing and you think I can only use them for skiing, then you're missing out on all sorts of winter sports that might be great fun, <laughs> you know, but you're like, but no, I trained myself for this exact sport only. You know, it's like, no, that's silly. Why wouldn't you use the strength that you developed to use in all sorts of different areas where strength is useful? 
you know, so you think about this person you love and you say, they are my training ground for building my strength of love and decreasing the amount of attachment. They are my training ground. And I want to lift my level of love with them while at the same time expanding that amount of love to everyone. They still get to be special. You still get to hang out with them the most. It's not like you suddenly, you know, bring everyone into like a giant, you know, polyamorous orgy weirdness or something, you know, we're not Osho, um, <laughs> you know, it's like be rational about it, you know, um, but that's the confusion, I think. The other confusion is that people think equanimity means neutrality and it doesn't mean neutrality. It means um, balance, definitely means balance, but it's not like you're turning everyone beige you're saying, I like red and I like blue, but blue is not better than red. I can like two colors. <laughs> like I'm an adult. I don't need to have a favorite color. You know, you're not just making everyone beige and saying, I will just like beige only. And everyone is now that. You can like all the different colors. You're just liking them with the same amount while recognizing their differences too. It's a delicate thing because of course the word equanimity is used in all sorts of contexts in Buddhism and it actually means something different in each of those contexts. You know, if you're talking about, you guys know this picture. Oh, I have this picture. You see this picture of the um, monk going up the path, chasing the elephant? Yes, the nine stages of mental abidance. So in the context of developing calm abiding, when you say equanimity, you're talking about the eighth of, of the eight antidotes to having just, you know, obstacles to calm abiding, right? So you have your classic faults of, you know, what? Laziness, forgetfulness, laxity and excitement, under application, over application, right? Then you antidote those. The last antidote when you're perfecting your concentration is applied equanimity. And that means allowing your mind to rest in balance without applying antidotes unnecessarily, which is not what we're talking about right now, <laughs> right? That's a whole nother conversation. It's a whole other Buddhist topic that's really in the context of developing single pointed concentration. And yet it's the same word. So you could think that, okay, I heard that word there. So now I'll plug it in here. Not what we're talking about. We'll also talk about equanimity in the context of minds and mental factors. When you Don't get confused. We're talking about immeasurable equanimity. Immeasurable equanimity, yeah, in the four immeasurables. Compassion, love, joy, equanimity, that one, that one, which is unbiased goodwill for all sentient beings unbiased goodwill, impartial goodwill. And it's still on the method side of the path, which means you're still allowed to recognize partiality while being impartial. You recognize you are partial to some people. I, I have this opinion about this person and this person and this person. And you know, it's, you're not pretending to not have your opinions. You're having your opinions and then you're not allowing them to dictate your level of goodwill. How do you do that? So it's the response to each person, which is one of compassion and love versus any kinds of other expectation, aversions, angers. Is that what you were talking about here for equanimity? Yes. Yeah. And we're talking about it as like the essential basis for love. If you're going to have love it, and it's real love and it's not attached love, it must have equanimity. Otherwise, it's going to be having less power, less impact, and it'll be less sustainable. So how do you think your way into equanimity in a way that becomes genuine? How do you think your way into this mindset that has unbiased goodwill while still recognizing differences in levels of rapport? Can I just make a comment about that because I'm not sure. sure that this is it but the entry point for me is just to remember that people um, suffer in very similar ways and that they're acting out of their afflictions just like I am and so that kind of opens up a feeling of compassion for everybody more equally 
that's an easier entry point for me than to kind of expand the feeling I have for my child outward. Yeah. Remember the suffering and the samsaric um, conditions, everybody's in them and it's, and you know, so that the compassion flows easily, more easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> for sure. And you know, that's, it's in a way developing like affinity affinity for all sentient beings or seeing that, you know, we all want happiness. We don't want suffering the thoughts that you have in the, you know, equalizing and exchanging self for other practices. And that's really, really useful and really effective. And if it's too challenging to think, even think of having the same amount of love for all sentient beings as you do for your child or your partner or your best friend or your mentor or whatever, if that's too overwhelming or it feels too weird just start with a good friend, <laughs> not even your best friend, you know, just like a person what you like <laughs> and say, okay, the degree of affection I have towards that person what I like, let's spread that amount. Because even that amount is going to be really profound in terms of your daily life experience. And there's a lot of ways into equanimity, lots of access routes. But even before that is to think about why would I want it? What's the benefit of it? You know, to get yourself kind of, yeah, I would like to have equanimity because part of us is like, I kind of like having preferential things. I, I kind of like having my special relationships. I don't even like this idea, you know, or how can I even, there's some political figures who I will never have affection for. I don't care what you say, but, uh, you know, so you got to get yourself prepared mentally until it becomes a real aspiration and then you'll engage with the tools joyfully because it's something that you want. So the benefit of equanimity. All right, try and find a time in your life where you've been in a group of people, some who you liked, some who you didn't like, some that you were indifferent to, but none of those emotions were super escalated or super vivid. You know, maybe it was a dinner party or a work party or something, and you were just milling around in a group of people that you had some opinions about, but none of them were rock solid. Okay, so imagine a time like that. And then imagine that now suddenly you're the host. And you've shifted from being one of the people milling about to someone who is in charge of looking after people making sure everyone has a meal, making sure everyone has a seat, making sure that people aren't getting left behind in the various activities. And you've shifted from participant to host. <laughs> and when you shift from participant to host, it's something that you did voluntarily and happily. Okay, can you picture a situation like that? You know, whether it's happened or not, just imagine you're a voluntary host of something. And now the people that you don't like and the people you're indifferent to become people that you're in service of. And so you kind of soften the edges of your mild annoyance or irritation about them. And now you're thinking, how can I benefit them? How can I benefit them? I want them to be fed just like I want my friends to be fed and everyone's getting the same meal. So let's just make sure everyone gets it. I'm wondering if you could speak to something that, I, that has been on my mind um, as we've been discussing these factors and, and it has to do with the concept of, well, let's say the dinner party, for example, um, in life, sometimes what happens is we, we, um, have a presence of someone and they may have certain characteristics or behaviors that we determine aren't the best for us to be around. I'll, I'll give an example of maybe mm. someone at the party pulls out a bunch of alcohol and starts getting wasted or, you know, or starts being verbally abusive to someone else at the dinner party or, you, you know what I'm saying? And, and I think there's a certain level of, uh, I guess, tolerance that we can develop and still have the equanimity of, of love. But there's a point sometimes when we go, this is actually not a good match. This is not actually healthy. Um, and I don't think it's beneficial for, for either of us because I'm not able to perhaps radiate enough to, to help to influence this person to take another path. So maybe, maybe it's better for a separation to occur, like physical separation. And so then you go your separate ways 
And I'm wondering if you could speak to that concept because I know there's an edge to it where sometimes we all do that maybe a little bit too quick. And then the other people, you know, it, it is almost a defense mechanism and we cut off from being able to express compassion and being able to, you know, but I also know the other side of it, which is I've given maybe this person a chance over six months to go to a counselor. They want it, they decide, yes, I want to try to do this. I want to try to get healthier. So you give them that opportunity, but they, it, when it comes down to it, I, I've had this experience, the person pivots it against me and says, well, if you loved me, you would be okay that I have this drug habit, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's not psychologically healthy. <laughs> so anyway, but there's this like, you know, this, this, this point, I think that sometimes these, these cutoffs get made in, in our relationships where we just, we have to, that's it. You, you have to say goodbye. And but yeah, like, I don't know if you can speak to that. I think that's a part of love, right? But then ironically, when we're in families, sometimes we don't have the ability to cut off and so easily and go, you, you need to do your, you know, like you, you still have to see them physically and be present with them, maybe even live in the same house as them. I know this is a very complex topic, but <laughs> I wonder if you could speak to it. Well, um, I'm guessing, you know, because it's a Dharma group, there's some people who have been to Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and Al Anon. And what would they say? Detach with love, <laughs> right? Detach with love. And um, it, exactly, right? <laughs> One more with feeling, <laughs> detach with love. But um, this is the thing is that it is an aspect of attachment when it's flopped from love to attachment that thinks it's my job to fix this because it's uncomfortable for myself and others and I'm worried about you and your health. An aspect of attachment takes too much responsibility. You know, and your first responsibility is I'm in the best position to help others if I maintain my peace of mind. So my first responsibility is maintaining peace of mind. What do I need to do to maintain peace of mind that is not indulging self-cherishing and self-grasping, that's not indulging attachment, that is actually just a healthy assessment of this is what my capacity is right now. Yeah, this is my capacity right now and I got a solid hour for you and then I'm going to be done and best of luck to you. <laughs> and then you're off, you know, and it's, it's, you don't have to feel guilty about it or bad about it. It's just, that's my capacity. And if you have no capacity, for a certain dynamic, you know, it, it is kind of our job to name what we're up for, because if we don't, and we go past our capacity, the backlash is we become resentful and awful to be around, and we blame them for something we agreed to. We were the ones that agreed to it, and now we're mad at them. So, so come back to what do I need to maintain my peace of mind so that I can be of greatest benefit to as many as possible, including myself, what do I need to do? And that can be an embarrassing conversation for yourself if you identify as a helper or as a kind person or as ethical. It's embarrassing to acknowledge that you only have this amount of capacity with this person because you want to think of yourself as better than that. But there's some dynamics that have just gotten too entrenched and too enmeshed that, you know, your capacity might be big and wonderful and vast with these strangers over here, but with your family, it's like shrinks, you know? So, so it's got to have all this self-honesty and self-awareness and humor and kindness and just, that's all I got today, folks, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but yeah, detach with love, I would say, detach with love plus humor if you can, at least humor for your own silliness, you know? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, slowly, slowly, isn't it? But uh, you're, you're not alone, but to remember that that is a feature of attachment that says it's being loving. Yeah, that's, that's how attachment lies. It says, I'm being loving by saying, I need to fix this. That's that fixer in there, that little busy body in there, that is not love. It's tricky, isn't it? 
Yeah, so, so access points into equanimity, tons of access points in, and we'll do a meditation just touching on a few of them. But before we do equanimity, I just wanted to kind of come back to something that maybe a few of you have already looked at before, which is um, the first part of the sevenfold cause and effect for bodhicitta. And this is buying into a Buddhist worldview, whereas equanimity could be completely secular. You could engage with equanimity and not believe in Buddhism at all, and it could be very useful anyway. Sevenfold cause and effect, you need to be a bit of a Buddhist. So, you know, divide yourselves accordingly and um, grain of salt. But the first step is the recognition that all sentient beings have been our mother. How do you recognize all sentient beings have been our mother? You think about the fact that time is beginningless and that sentient beings, though as if infinite, are finite in number. You know, all throughout the universe, there are sentient beings, but there are no new ones being created. So time is beginningless, sentient beings are finite. That means very, 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 very likely we have all bumped into each other before many, many times. We're looking at the particular time we bumped into each other in the dynamic of mother and child. Why? The archetypal mother is the best example in samsara of unconditional love. Okay, so of course that is a point to argue with, um, especially in the West, but not always the West. You know, the East has tricky mothers just the same as the West, but um, we often have mother issues and then think we can't do this meditation. No. So um, what you want to do is to think of your own mother or mother figure, okay? It can be your mother figure, it could be your father, or a mentor, or a teacher, and try and remember someone in your life who had the archetypal qualities of mother. You know, the archetypal qualities of unconditional love, of putting your needs before theirs, of acceptance and, you know, the ability to cope with the gross aspects of you, you know, changing your diapers, um, feeding you and cleaning your spit up and taking care of you when you're sick and would bail you out of jail <laughs> and would love you even if you did something terrible. And if, the, if your mother is not that person, that's fine. Pick someone else. You're trying to just tap into in humanity and in human relationships, there exists that kind of love. Imperfectly, inconsistently, sure, but just tap into the fact that that type of love exists in human dynamics, even if only for short periods of time. And then hold that as your example of a relationship that has existed between you and every single sentient being. And these were all my mother in the sense that they have been so kind to me at some point. And it might be very poignant and tragic that we don't remember that and that maybe we're not so kind to each other now, but touch back into at one point in some life, we loved each other. We really loved each other. Each and every one of us has had that close relationship with each other where we would really go to the ends of the earth for each other. And instead of thinking about what you would do for them, try and think of what they would have done for you. And really allow that to turn into a deep gratitude. And, you know, if you can use examples in the animal kingdom, you can use examples from history, you can use whatever you need to use to evoke that sense of how kind sentient beings can be. And then make it personal and think, they have been that kind to me. It has to be personal or else it doesn't work. They have been that kind to me. And that gratitude develops into an affinity and a seeing sentient beings as appealing. And what's triggering for us is that to see sentient beings as appealing, we need to have thought that they have benefited us. And that feels a little bit coarse and a little bit uncomfortable to name. You want to think that your love could be just pure and just flow without any conditions and that sentient beings don't have to have benefited me. I will love them anyway, because I'm a heroic bodhisattva. But you actually have to start where you are, which is it is much easier to find people appealing 
if you think they have benefited you or that they do benefit you. It's true, you know, like we want it to be subtler and more profound and less conditional to that. And it will be, and it's going in that direction. But start with that real gratitude that is, I needed sentient beings to get this far. They benefited me directly over countless lifetimes. All of them helped me get to where I am today. All of the qualities that I like about myself were learned and supported by relationships with others. You know, you want to say, I have inherently existent insight. I have inherently existent humor, intelligence, like they're yours. You, they're, they're yours, but nominally, you know, they're, it was a coming together of conditions that allowed you to have those qualities. Celebrate them, be happy that you have them, but don't think that you made them all by yourself. You know, sentient beings were a part of who you became and feeling that deep gratitude, then you want to repay their kindness. And even framing it as repay can feel kind of icky, like, oh, that's too coarse. But if you can be a real rich gratitude, that's like, oh, I so much want to help the way that I have been helped. I so much want to support in the way I have been supported. Then it becomes love wanting their happiness in that open-ended way where the mother love, the archetypal love, then can become the love you have for others. So you're not wanting to see all sentient beings as your children initially. No, don't do that, even though that's also a very amazing love. What you want to do is to think of a relationship where you elevate sentient beings. With the children, you might have this amazing expansive love, but part of you is kind of pulling them up and lifting them up because they're not quite developed yet. And you want to have the association in your mind of respect. So that's why we pick mother and not child. Thoughts, questions? So that's the Buddhist access point into love, one of many. Equanimity doesn't rely on that worldview. But do you have any thoughts that come up when we look at that? I'll pop it back on the screen and you can just jump in. Just a, a quick one is sure. uh, it, when you describe that so beautifully, that I can really connect with, that's so helpful. Um, and I, I, it also makes me think about um, dependent arising. Yep. And a very personal experience of it in, in a way that it can express itself in gratitude. So that uh, really resonates for me. Thank you. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. It's a powerful teaching, but it, it's, it's, it can be easy to discard as, I don't know, old fashioned or not relevant or too simplistic, or, you know, there's a lot of way, pe a lot of ways that people discard the sevenfold cause and effect. And I think it's because we haven't made it personal enough. We haven't made it visceral enough. Yes, exactly. It really needs to be personal. Yeah. Uh, that's very beneficial. Thank you. Yeah. Other, other thoughts about that particular technique? Yeah, Pia? Um, so I feel uh, if you could help me with uh, something, I'm, I'm a little stuck because I, I, uh, I think the other way around. So if I'm surrounded by people I've seen a million times before, we have all sort of killed and abused and done all kinds of all, all the horrible things towards each other. And that's where I'm like, I get into that alley and I don't get out of it. Sort of. Well, you're not wrong. I mean, we have done all of that to each other. Absolutely. We're just choosing to emphasize what will evoke a heart open experience. And it's a little bit like how you identify yourself. Like if you think of your own identity, you might think of any number of surface things, I don't know, gender, nationality, whatever. But um, if you go a little bit deeper, sometimes we identify either as our qualities or our faults and probably our secret self kind of identifies with our faults and thinks that we're you know, secretly bad person and people are gonna find that out someday and not love us anymore. Trip, you know, a classic tale, right? We all kind of probably have that occasionally come up. Um, if people only knew they wouldn't love me. 
or you know maybe you have a extreme kind of pride or something that thinks the opposite whatever it's like you do have faults and you do have qualities sentient beings have been horrible to you and have been wonderful to you both are true externally just as both are true internally and when you sit with what is more true what is more true and of course, on the surface, it is more true that we've probably hurt each other more times than we've helped each other, actually. You know, thinking of all the eons in the hell realms that we've spent together, we're probably chopping each other's heads off and all sorts of horrible things, eons of it. But it's actually more true that we have Buddha nature than we are our afflictions, because we are not our afflictions. They're habitual tendencies driven by ignorance that are removable. Your Buddha nature is not removable. You can't remove it. There's no way to remove it. It's always something that will be with you, always has been with you. And your Buddha nature can be developed and expanded all the way to enlightenment. Your negative states of mind, faults and mistakes can be completely destroyed. So for your own identity, it makes more sense to identify with and as your Buddha potential. Because it's actually more true in terms of sentient beings, their Buddha potential is more true than their afflictions and their mistakes. Even if their mistakes and afflictions have been the thing that was most coarsely surface present, it is not who they are, who they've ever been. And when they've behaved as the mother archetype, that was closer to resonance with their Buddha nature, closer to their reality. So we're just trying to shift, even though it's hard, even though it doesn't come naturally, to in ourselves identifying with our potential, for others identifying with their potential. And then everything that is not a symptom of that potential, everything that is afflicted, we're seeing as adventitious, extra, additional. Just like if someone has a horrible flu and is sneezing everywhere, you don't think sneezing is pleasant. You don't want them to get their stuff on you, but you don't think they are a cold. They are a flu. No, they're a person with the flu and you wanna make sure you don't get sick from their sickness, but you're not thinking they're bad for having it. You know, it's something extra and additional that will be healed at some point. Do you know what I mean? So you're, you're kind of, we naturally more identify with people's healthy aspect. <laughs> rather than their sick aspects. So we want to do that mentally as well. I don't know if that framing works for you. Thank you. It was super helpful to remember the Buddha nature. I forgot about that. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> yeah. 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 And there's a, an addition in the comments of um, sometimes our terrible experiences lead to liberation too. And that's exactly true. That's exactly true. And it, you know, going back to equanimity, that's a very useful access point into equanimity is to think even when people have been horrible sometimes that's quite useful <laughs> you know so that's another kind of gateway but when we're looking at the the mother section seeing all sentient beings as having been our mother and bring their kindness wishing to repay their kindness um anything else to unpack there before we go to meditation um, may i ask a question please venerable sure yeah sure um, I was, I was still thinking back on something you said a little while earlier about, you know, what is the benefit of equanimity, equanimity um, so that I really believe. And, and I was thinking, you know, that on paper, it sounds good to me and I like it, but I feel like in my life, I can be polite to people that I don't like or who I find difficult. Um, and it's, and you know, I manage okay. So, so why do I really need to do all this work to have this like amazing unbiased goodwill for everyone when my life is okay with just being courteous we need it? Yeah, it's a, it's a very fair question. And it's the question we have to ask ourselves because just because we like the idea doesn't mean we're gonna really have energy to put into it if other things seem you know more vital. And you think, well, I can have love and compassion even though I don't have equanimity. Um, it's working out okay, I'll try and get better. What, you know, it's a, it's a fair enough thought to have. And, and I think what we wanna ask ourselves is, wouldn't it be better? 
wouldn't it be better with equanimity? And it's hard to hard to convince yourself of that as an individual right at first sometimes. So then think globally. How has it worked out when each nation thinks me first, but I'll be polite to the rest of you? But me first. Or America first. How's that worked out in terms of relationships and um, interdependence and collaboration and you know, when we're thinking me first, it's kind of like you only give yourself your own tools and skill set. It actually is a disadvantage to the individual to only give your stuff to the individual. You know, you're offering here, okay, me first, which means I can offer to me the things that I have. But if you think all sentient beings, you're offering the things that you have to all sentient beings and inviting all the things they have to offer to you. So now the, the resources have expanded exponentially. The things that you have access to and connection with have hugely increased. You know, I was thinking about the neighborhood that I'm in right now in Montana is very rural. And all of us have like our own little system for shoveling the sidewalk of snow. And we all have our own little system of gates and all of this. And it's all very individual. And I thought, wouldn't it be lovely if like one neighbor put a ton of money into getting a good snow plow and a different neighbor put a lot of money into getting chains. And, you know, and we all didn't exhaust our resources, but just put it into one and then shared it with each other rather than all of us having lesser quality things, but the whole set just for us, we could have high quality things and share them and all benefit from that. You know, use whatever example you like, but when we're all collaborating, say for green energy or something like this, if you're only using the resources of your nation and only giving them to your nation, that's of limited benefit. But if you're saying, here are the resources of my nation here, then other nations go, oh, here are the resources of my nation here. And then it becomes this collaborative thing that everyone benefits from. So it's in your own best interest and it's also in alignment with reality. That's the, that's the tricky thing. So it's equanimity and impermanence are pointing you to the wisdom realizing emptiness in a very gentle, less confronting way. They're pointing you in that direction but you know, kind of calmly without freaking you out. <laughs> they aren't the wisdom realizing emptiness, but they are pointing you there. And that is not an accident. So there's a, there's a question in the chat and um, it is, do we confuse the quality of Buddha nature with the quality of mental afflictions? That is our belief that mental afflictions are permanent comes from our sense that our Buddha nature is permanent. What is the antidote? Hmm. Possibly, yes, this could possibly be the problem. And possibly the problem is too that we don't properly understand Buddha nature because Buddha nature has a permanent aspect and an impermanent aspect, both. Remember, so Buddha nature is, on one hand, the permanent aspect is the fact that your mind is empty of inherent existence means that it can develop. Emptiness is permanent. The mind that is empty is impermanent. Change is moment to moment and needs to be developed. So, you know, making it a visual, think of your Buddha nature like a lump of gold that is, you know, not going to be changed by all of the dirt heaped on top of it. It's a perfect lump of gold. The dirt can't get inside of it. There it is from beginningless time under the mountain of your afflictions. That is a permanent thing, you know, relatively speaking, go with me. And um, you're cleaning off the mountain and cleaning off the mountain and you eventually get to the lump of gold, but it's just a lump of gold. It's not been formed into anything. So what you want is you get to the raw lump of gold that has been there from beginningless time, the Buddha nature that is empty of inherent existence, the mind that is empty of inherent existence, that aspect. And then you need to mold it into a Buddha shape. And then it's finished. You know, so potential isn't perfection. It's the potential for perfection. 
you know, Buddha nature is, um, the nature is like an ability or a goal or what the finished product will be. Nature is talking in terms of potentiality, not in terms of the finished product, but all of the raw material is there the whole time. Yeah, all of the raw material for your Buddhahood has been there from beginningless time, but it's not finished. It's not like you're a Buddha and then forgot, you know, or you're a Buddha and then have to wake up to it. It's that you have all the ingredients for Buddhahood and then need to shape them. Yeah, I need to clear off all of what prevents you from seeing it and then develop what is there into the finished product. But was that your, was that your question or was it a different angle? No, no, that's it. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's um, emptiness is coming. Um, it's certainly a very quick antidote to attachment if you get it. And um, it just, uh, there's other techniques as well that might be, if not easier, more immediately applicable anyway, while we're still on our wisdom project, <laughs> slowly, slowly. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the equanimity really is a good go-to meditation. If you were wanting an analytical meditation project for your daily practice, even five minutes of equanimity every day will change the way you view others in such a positive light. So all of the more advanced practices then will come much more easily as well because you have the solid foundation.